I, I want to start out talking a little bit about what are hormones and then what are plant growth regulators. Most of you should have got a little pretest. Did you get a pretest? And there were three questions on it that Marion distributed earlier. So I'm going to go back and visit those topics just a little bit. Did everybody hear me okay? Mike, I've had a cold for the last week, and so my voice is just coming back. So if, if you can't hear me, I'll try and speak up a little bit. So to start with, let's see if I can get my clicker to work. It was working a minute ago. Get it back to that. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the objectives are to talk about what are plant hormones and what are plant growth regulators, which ones are used in fruit production, um, and then understanding kind of some of the management considerations. If you're going to use a plant growth regulator or a plant hormone, what are some of the snags that you're going to run into? Like, what are some of the things you can do to avoid those complications or those difficulties? Um, and then talk a little bit about plant growth regulators for fruit thinning, primarily for apples, um, and, and how the, those are used and some of the complications as well. So what is, a, what is a hormone? First of all, a hormone is a signal molecule. It is a molecule that's produced in a plant to signal some type of response. It's usually active at very low concentrations. Uh, it's endogenous. Endogenous means that it is produced within the plant and transported in the plant to another part of the plant and then causes a response, okay? So endogenous means it comes from within. Uh, those that came in late, if you guys that are on the end can maybe pass the handouts down so everybody can get one um, so that you can follow along, okay? It's synthesized or produced in, in one location that may be active at that location or it may be transported to another location in the plant, okay? And so, so it can be active at that location or it can be active at another part of the plant. So it's, it's kind of analogous. We, a lot of us, when we took high school biology, learned about hormones as far as what they do for humans or what they do in, in animal systems. So you learn about testosterone and estrogen and insulin and all these different things that have this, have an analogous role in, in humans or in animals, but in plants, there's, there's a whole different set of them. So some of the plant hormones, one of the first ones that was discovered is auxin. Auxin acts in the plant. It, it's a growth promoter. It usually is produced at the shoot tip of the plant and it's translocated down the plant. It moves from the tip back towards the base of the plant. And one of the functions of auxin is what's called apical dominance. What that does is the auxin that's produced at the tip and it's translocated back along the plant, it suppresses lateral buds from growing. So you've seen a plant where it's growing and all the growth is happening at the shoot tip, right? And none of the side buds are growing. They're just there, but they're not growing. And then if you remove the shoot tip, you get side growth to sprout out. That's called apical dominance. The shoot tip is controlling whether or not the lateral, brand, lateral shoots get to grow. And that's mediated by auxin, okay? Another one is gibberellic acid or gibberellin. And gibberellin is a growth promoter. It's involved in cell division, but also uh, shoot elongation, okay? So the, the gibberellic acid was originally discovered because there was a fungus that attacked rice and the way that they knew that the fungus had attacked the rice is the rice took off and grew really, really tall and then died. And they discovered that what was making the rice grow really, really tall was gibberellic acid that was produced by this fungus. And it just turned out that gibberellic acid is actually naturally occurring. It occurs in the plant. The next one is cytokinins. And cytokinins are involved in promoting cell division. So it's a, it's a growth promoter, okay? And cytokinins, instead of being produced in the, in the sh shoot tip, are oftentimes produced in the roots and then move up. So they're moving the opposite direction of auxin. Another one is abscisic acid. And abscisic acid is a stress response hormone. And one of the, originally it was thought that it was involved in causing the leaves to abscise or to drop off, which turns out not to be the case, so it's a, it's a bad name for it. But it's very much involved in drought stress. 
one of the big functions of abscisic acid is if the roots sense that they're too dry, they, promote, they, they produce abscisic acid and the abscisic acid moves up through the plant to tell the leaves they were running out of water down here and they close the stomates on the leaves so that water loss is diminished. Okay, that's one of the functions of abscisic acid. So it's a stress signal. And it's also involved in senescence in, in, as the plant is shutting down. The, the next one that is important is ethylene. Ethylene is actually a gas at room temperature. And it's also involved in stress response. But the big, big, big one, if you're in fruit production, what does ethylene do? It ripens fruit. So if you go down to the packing shed where they're storing fruit, one of the biggest concerns they have is ethylene. Ethylene builds up, it causes it to ripen faster, okay? And it's a gas, it's, it's in the air. When you get it around ripe apples, there's ethylene coming off those apples. And they're signaling the rest of the fruit in the bucket to start to ripen as well, okay? But it's also involved in stress. So if a plant's under stress, it produces ethylene and it signals the rest of the plant or the, and the plants around it that it's under stress. It's, it, the response can be temperature dependent, but it's ethylene. Whenever the plant's under stress, it will, it will release ethylene. Okay, so at hot temperatures, cool temperatures, if you, if you, if you bark the tree with a, with a mower as you're going by, that will induce ethylene, okay? If you, if you take a fruit and bruise it, that will induce more ethylene. So there's a lot of different, any different kind of injury will cause ethylene. So, so the rate at which the fruit, the fruit is a living organism and it respires. It uses up sugar to, to continue to live, for the cells to live. The rate at which it does that is temperature dependent. The warmer it is, the faster it grows. So the question is, is ethylene a temperature response? I'll get more into this a little bit later. But it's, it's a general uh, stress response and a general ripening signal. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Yeah, another. There's other, there's other organisms involved in that, and, that, and I've actually got that under others. So some of the brucinolides and the jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, polyamines, some of those are involved in, if an insect is, then it's a signal that's released, okay? And it has two functions. Number one, it attracts more pests. The other thing it does in some plants is it, it stimulates a response. So that like for certain plants, if an insect starts chewing on the leaves, it produces things that make the leaves taste nasty and, and defense against that. But there's a lot of different, not so much ethylene, but some of the others. I'm not gonna talk a lot about this jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, polyamines, because we don't use them to try and regulate growth. So the next thing that I wanna talk about is, is um, plant growth regulators. But before I do that, I, I need to point out that just because there's a little bit more of auxin, it doesn't always signal the response that we think it does because oftentimes what stimulates the response isn't response. Just the level of auxin that's available, but it's the ratio of auxin to cytokinin. So you got auxin coming from the top of the plant, you got cytokinin coming from the bottom, and what regulates the response is the ratio of those two, the balance of those two. They're kind of like they're competing against each other in a way, but they're not. But it's the combination that causes the signal. So that gets that makes things just a little bit more complicated. So plant growth regulators, we've talked about now the hormones. The plant growth regulators are things that we use to manage fruit trees, and some of them are the hormones. Okay? They're just the, the hormones that the plant makes, and we've got them in large quantities. And we mix them up in a spray tank and we put them on the leaves to get a, a response by, by just blasting the plant with its own hormones, basically. Another one that we use quite regularly is an analog of a natural plant hormone. An analog means that it's very similar chemically. It's not the exact same thing. But when it gets in the plant, it acts a lot like a hormone, but it's not the exact same molecule. 
There's also materials that we use in, in fruit management that alter the natural hormone levels in the plant. So they, they're not, we're not applying them. Yeah. Okay. Tom saying that uh, those of you that are, that are uh, participating online, you need to mute your own microphone so that he's not hearing it. If you can do that, I appreciate it. Okay. You can hear somebody moving around. So, all right. Um, so we can apply materials that alter the natural hormone cycles in the plant, or we can, we can apply materials that will alter the ability of the plant to sense and respond to the hormones that exist inside of it. So these are four different approaches, four different types of plant growth regulators. So the first one, gibberellins. The gibberellins I talked about, the naturally occurring, we can, we can get those as a, as a formulation, mix it up in a spray tank, put it on the leaves, and, it, and cause a response just by adding more gibberellins to the mix. And so those are an example of naturally occurring plant hormones. Some of the commercial formulations, ProGib and NovaGib are both GA3. There's different gibberellins, and they have different types of activity. ProVide is GA4 and 7 together. So it's two different gibberellins than ProGib. And I'll talk about where some of these are used commercially. Analogs of natural plant hormones, one of them is benzyladenine. Benzyladenine is the active ingredient in Max Cell. How many of you use Max Cell in your apples? Okay, so some of you that have apples, you know what Max Cell is. It's a benzyladenine is a is a is an analog of the naturally occurring cytokinins which cause cell divisions. What does a max cell do? One of you be brave. Roger? In what tissue? Okay, so you're, it, it's there to get the apples bigger. How does it do it? It's cytokinins cause cell division. So if you apply it at the right time, you get more cell division and your apple gets bigger. Okay? Why don't we just use the naturally occurring cytokinin? Well, the answer is, if you extract cytokinins, that by the time you extract them, they start degrading, and before you can get around to actually applying them, they're all inactivated. They're not stable outside of the plant, and so we've come up with analogs that are very similar, but they're actually stable so that we can actually use them without them breaking down. Another example is naphthalene acetic acid, or NAA. What's NAA used for, Chris? I'll call on you. Thinning, what is it? The thinning agent, okay? It actually is a analog of naturally occurring auxins, okay? Auxins, the, 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 the naturally occurring form is indole acetic acid, but it's also extremely unstable. If I extract it from the plant, it just all degrades. And so NAA is very stable, and so I can use it as, as a... a Applied oxen. Okay. Other things that we can use as plant growth regulators are materials that alter hormone levels. So hormone releasing agents. Ethophon is the active ingredient in what the, the formulation that often we use is ethyl. Ethophon breaks down and releases ethylene. Okay. We can't apply ethylene because it's a gas. So we if we tried to apply it, it just off in the atmosphere. But we can spray ethophon, which is a stabilized molecule, and it gets on in the plant, it breaks apart and releases ethylene right where we want it to be released at the time we want it to be released. What do we use ethylene for? To ripen fruit, what else? Somebody else had a comment. Come on, who's a cherry grower? Be brave. Okay, so you use it as a a compound to, to stimulate fruit abscission, right? If you're going to shake your cherries, you put ethylene on so that the fruit starts to abscise, and when you shake it, all the fruit comes off at once, okay? We can also use synthesis inhibitors. Um, there's One of these is prohexadione calcium. It's sold as Apogee. Apogee blocks gibberellins. So if gibberellins promote growth, and I, and I stop the production of gibberellins inside the plant, then it, it's a growth retardant, okay? AVG is the active ingredient in retain, and that is a, it's a 
um, ethylene blocker. It blocks the plant being able to produce ethylene. Okay. And then the last class, the example, there's just one example, but that is a response inhibitor. So one MCP is sold as Smart Fresh, and what it does is it blocks the plant's ability to sense the presence of ethylene. So it, it, there's, there's receptors in the cells of the plant that, that, signal, that, that respond to that presence of ethylene, and MCP comes in and just disables those receptors so the plant cannot sense ethylene, and that's used for what? Storage, why would you use it in storage? You, you block the plant from, re, you block the fruit from responding to ethylene and it slows down the ripening process. Okay, Chris? So does that basically shut it down? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons why it's not applied in the field. One of which is what? What's, eth what's the form of ethylene? How does it come? Gas. Unfortunately, MCP is a gas as well. So the best way to apply it is you pick the fruit and you put it in a room and you release MCP in as a gas. And, and that's, the, that's a major reason. We don't have a, a methaphon. We don't have a MCP in a sprayable form that is released in the plant yet. Yeah, we're actually working on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. It actually is. Okay. What is what the question is? Are can any of these be used organically? And the answer is yes, because if we're taking a naturally occurring hormone and then we're applying it. And that should, we're not violating organic standards, okay? We're manipulating the plant's growth by using its own hormones. So some of them are and some of them aren't. And you just have to see which ones are. But, but in and of itself, by applying a hormone from outside isn't, isn't a violation of organic standards, okay? Let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about some examples. I just thrown out a few examples of each, and I didn't put this in here, but this is actually a review article from a few years ago where they listed all the different types of commercial plant growth regulators that have been used in Apple. There's like two pages of them. But they all fall in one of those themes that we talked about. Some of these are no longer used, um, and, and some of them are just different variations on what we've already talked about. So let's move on and talk about what are the processes we want might want to regulate and how might these be used and i've kind of introduced this a little bit but let's go into more detail so one of them is one process is flowering and fruit set one is vegetative growth control one is fruit abscission and one is fruit characteristics these are kind of the general things themes that we can go after so i asked a pre-test question about this we're going to go to this for a minute what's the primary difference between plant growth regulators and plant hormones and where, where they act in the plant, where they came from, plant development process they control, the stability in the spray tank, all the above, none of the above. Who says A? Raise your hand. Who says B? Who says C? Who says D? Who says E? Who says F? Who didn't vote? <laughs> okay. Actually, the, the difference, well, there's, this is a little bit of a trick question because in the case of, this is what you guys answered on the pretest. The, 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 the most correct answer, now this is why I get a little tricky. The most correct answer is where they came from. What's a plant hormone? It's endogenous. It's coming from within the plant. A plant growth regulator is something we're applying to the plant from the outside to try and regulate a response. But question number D in the case of some of these, that is a difference. You know, the reason we don't use a, normal, a naturally occurring plant hormone is because it's not stable. So we use an analog, right? So that's also a correct answer. Okay, so let's move on from there. So here's some, a few different applications of plant growth regulators in fruit production. So it was discovered a number of years ago that foliar applications of gibberellin, gibberellin A3, GA3 or gibberellic acid, about midsummer will reduce the number of flower buds that form on peach trees. Okay, because during midsummer is when the flower buds are being initiated for the next year. So if we apply 
a small amount of gibberellic acid to the leaves, enough of it gets moved into the plant that it suppresses the number of flower buds. Okay, so why would you want to suppress flower buds and peaches? Well, oftentimes we get too many flower buds on peaches. And where it's oftentimes used is in processing peaches and clean peaches, where they don't put a lot of labor into detailed pruning, they don't put a lot of labor into hand thinning, they're just producing lots and lots of peaches and, and picking them green and canning them. So they don't, they don't have a lot of money to, to invest in hand thinning and all these other issues. But if they go in midsummer the year before, they can limit the number of flower buds. Why would we not want to do that here? Yeah, we get winter kill on our buds. So if we go in and start limiting the number of flower buds and then we get winter kill, that's a scary deal. So typically, and not just in Utah, but typically for, if you're going for a fresh market, dessert quality peaches, it's not really common that we would use this approach, okay? But it is one strategy and it is used in peach production. Another example is the same idea only in, in tart cherries. We applied Pro-Jib pro is one product, but, but gibberellic acid about three to four weeks after bloom and we can reduce the number of flower buds the next year in cherries. Where would you want to use this? We don't thin cherries typically, so why would we want to do it? Say, say that again. So the comment is on new trees that we want to get big. Actually, yes, this is one, one application of this. So if you've got a new cherry orchard, and you're worried that it's going to start setting too many fruit, you can actually reduce the amount of fruit by putting this on in the, in the um, spring, three to four weeks after bloom, and suppress flower buds for the next year. And do this for a few years until the, you get the tree up to the size that you want it, and then you, you shift gears and let it to start to flower and fruit. I don't know a lot of cherry growers in Utah that use this, but it's really common in Michigan. Um, where they're trying to get a lot of growth early on. I mean, I think the growers that I've talked to use, use nitrogen kind of in the same way. You push the tree really hard with a lot of growth, and it's going to be less likely to flower. But you can also do it with hormones by suppressing flower bud initiation. Okay? All right, Jessa. And, and the other time you use it is in an old tree. So one of the problems that we see sometimes is if the tree gets old and under stress, it starts making too many flower buds. And then it has too many fruit, which put it into further stress, which means it makes more, even more flower buds the next year. So if you get way too many flowers and not enough leaves, it's a way to bring the, the tree back into check. So maintaining vegetative vigor on young trees and preventing overproduction in old trees. This is something that we've started using at Kaysville on a couple of our cherry blocks that got out of hand. We let them get too produce too many fruit. We were doing some studies on drought stress on them and we, the trees got stressed and they just started over fruiting and we were worried that they would just go into decline and just kind of go into a tailspin and fruit themselves to death. And one way to bring them back is to put small rates of gibberellin on, slow that down, get more leaves, less fruit, and bring the tree back into balance again, okay? I, I talked to a few growers here in Utah that tried this years ago and they got a little carried away, they put on too much, and instead of getting a slight suppression in flowering, next year they came back and the trees had hardly a flower bud on them. They were like biennial apples, and that was kind of scared them away. So you have to be careful that the rate is really critical. You don't want to overshoot. Okay, post-bloom thinning of apples, we use a number of uh, thinning agents. We'll talk more about this in a minute. I want to talk first about some of the other PGR examples, and then we'll come back and talk more about thinning. So vegetative growth control. Okay, so we already talked about Apogee a little bit. Apogee is the gibberellin inhibitor. So if we don't, and gibberellin's involved in shoot elongation. So if we cut the gibberellin back by suppressing it in the plant, we get reduced shoot growth. So if you look here in the picture, it's a little bit hard to see, but you've got Apogee tree to tree on the left and, and the untreated control on the right. And if you look up in the tops of the trees, you'll see that shoots are much longer in the untreated control. So by putting Apogee on that growth suppressant, 
you get more spurs instead of big long shoots, okay? What does that do for you? It reduces the amount of pruning you have to use. It gives you some fruiting wood instead of long, vigorous suckers that you're just gonna have to prune out as well. This graph on the right is Macintosh untreated, Macintosh with Apogee, Cortland untreated, Cortland with Apogee, Gala, and the number of pruning cuts that had to be made to bring that tree back into balance. And you can see by using Apogee at the right time of year, you can suppress the growth so you got a lot more of the kind of fruiting wood that you wanna keep and a lot less of the big vigorous shoots that you have to start cutting off to bring the tree back, okay? The other example is that it reduces sensitivity to fire blight. For some reason, when we apply Apogee, de decrease the gibberellic acid, then we, we slow the growth down and that, that wood that's produced during slow growth is much less prone to having fire blight move down through it. So oftentimes we use Apogee to slow the growth of the tree and make it less susceptible to fire blight. We, the, the tree will still get infected with fire blight, but the fire blight doesn't go, the strikes don't go zipping down through the wood nearly as fast, okay? So that's the other example, all right? Um, one that's, another one that's, I don't know, a lot of people use, I, I know a few people that have used it. NAA, what's NAA again? What's the active ingredient? What, what, or what's the mechanism by which it works? Okay, it's an auxin, and what, is, what do auxins do? Suppress, uh, lateral. Okay, so they suppress lateral growth. So auxin, the NAA is actually used to suppress root suckers. What you do is you cut the root suckers off and then paint a solution of NAA on the cut surface. And what that does is it's, it's telling that shoot that you just cut off that it's still there and it suppresses lateral bud breaks, whereas otherwise if you cut it off, you're gonna get a whole bunch of bud breaks. So if you go out and just cut suckers, and you're getting a whole bunch of suckers sprouting up just below where you cut them, you know, below the soil line, if you go out and cut them and put NAA on, it's suppressing those, and so that you don't get even more suckers coming up, okay? This is one, this is a, a treatment, this is a picture I took in a, in a sweet cherry orchard. And you can use plant growth regulators to induce branching. How many of you are sweet cherry growers? Get a few of you. How many of you struggle with the sweet cherry tree that wants to grow these big long shoots with no branches and you don't get enough branches where you want it? Okay, so one of the ways you can do this is with plant growth regulators. So what was done here, this right here, there's a scar there and then you can see some paint. What they did is they came in with a little hacksaw blade and just made a cut through the bark into the cambium right above a bud, an existing bud, okay? And then they mixed up promelin, which is a combination of gibberellic acid and benzylatinine, so a GA and a cytokinin, mixed them with latex paint, and then just painted some of that paint on the cut surface. Okay, so what that did is three things. Number one, if I, if I disrupt the, the phloem, if I cut down to the cambium, the oxen that's coming from the top of the plant can't get to that bud because I just disrupted the phloem and it's not being, it's not influencing that bud anymore, okay? Another thing that I did is I put a whole bunch of cytokinin on it, which is the signal coming from the root that the oxen's trying to suppress, and then I put a bunch of, of gibberellin, which causes shoot elongation. Now, I've told that bud it's okay to wake up and grow, and I've given it a bunch of gibberellin so that it grows fast and long. So I can stimulate this branch right here grew as the result of that cut and those hormones that were applied. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so yeah, you can tell where you've been, right? Yeah, so the question is why would you mix it with paint? Main reason is so you can see where you've been, okay? Which ones you've treated and which ones you haven't. And there's, there's more to it than that because the latex will actually hold the material in contact with the cut and it can actually diffuse out of that latex into the plant, okay? But the, primarily it's a practical thing, so yes. So the cut disrupts the oxen transport and the BA counter out the oxen and then the GA causes the shoot to grow, okay? That's how that works. Abscission control is another 
uh, process that we use to, to control uh, or that we use plant growth regulators to regulate. So some of the examples, one is pre-harvest drop. So some, and this is particularly in apples, some cultivars of apple, just about the time they get to the point where their fruit's getting close enough to be ripe that we want to pick it, the fruit starts dropping on the ground, okay? And for years and years, we've known that if we use oxen, NAA, and we spray it on the tree, it will actually slow that process down. And what it is, is it's, it's apical dominance working the other way. You've got oxen coming from the fruit, going into the plant and saying, don't drop me yet. And it, and it slows that senescence process down. But about 20 years ago, we found something that worked a heck of a lot better than NAA, and that is AVG to retain. And retain works how? Which hormone does it affect? It's up there for you. It blocks ethylene synthesis. And ethylene is involved in fruit ripening, but it's also involved in the fruit abscission or the formation of that layer that causes the fruit to drop off. So if I can stop that layer from forming, then the fruit doesn't drop off the plant. Um, typically it's applied 30 days before harvest. One of the benefits is that you're stopping the drop, but the, the, the developmental process of the fruit continues. So the, the color continues to get uh, more intense. Um, the fruit stays firm and it stores better because ethylene's not just involved in abscission of the fruit, but it's involved in softening of the fruit and, and post-harvest breakdown of the fruit. So if I can slow those down, then not only is it going to keep the fruit on there a little longer so I can get it picked, but it's going to make it store better and stay firmer until it gets to the end consumer. So the question does it work is in stone fruits as well as apples. Uh, it's primarily used in apples. There's other approaches that are, we can use in stone fruits that do kind of similar things that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. This is primarily used in apples and, and pears. Okay, so here's kind of an example. So our, our two approaches to stop drop, one is NAA and one is retain. So in the graph here, you can see what percentage of the fruit had dropped off at certain dates starting in early October into mid-November. This is from Red Delicious Trees in Michigan. You can see that by the 23rd of October, we had 8.5% of the fruit on the ground when we didn't do anything. We had 2% on the ground if we used NAA several weeks before harvest, and 1% and if we used retain. But if you go out to the middle of November, 82% of the control fruits on the ground 77% of the NAA. So it's kind of, NAA is delayed it a little bit, but not a whole lot. But look at the retain. We've got only 7% on the ground. It, it helps that fruit stay on a lot better. It's much more effective than NAA. Now, if we want to go in the other direction, we already talked about this a little bit. If we want to get the fruit to abscise more quickly, we can use ethophon. okay? But, so ethophon is going to release ethylene, which is going to cause all the fruit to start abscising at the same time, but what else is it going to do? It's going to cause the, go ahead. It's going to ripen the fruit sooner. So if, the, if, if I'm stimulating ripening, the negative parts of ripening are the fruit's going to get too soft maybe, okay? So I've got to be really careful when I'm using something that's going to stimulate ripening that I get it just right so that I can speed up the, the abscission process but not speed up the ripening process so that the fruit's mushed by the time I get it off the tree. So it's, it's a kind of a balancing act. Now, can you take a little of pollination? Yeah, so that's, that's the challenge. Is if, if I'm, the question is, can I use a little bit of one to do one thing and a little bit of another? So they're, they're both affecting the same processes. So one process I want, the other process I don't. And if I try and do both, they're just going to interact so that I won't get the abscission that I need. So it's always a balancing act, okay? Um, one of the other challenges with ethophon is that the rate at which that it's released, releasing the ethylene, so the rate at which it breaks down is temperature dependent. And so you were asking earlier about temperature. When I use ethophon, if I put the same rate on and the temperatures are in the 90s, I'm going to get a much, much, much different response than if I put the same rate on and the temperatures are in the 70s. So you've, you've got to be really careful about using it and figuring out, okay, 
if it's going to be hot, either I don't want to use Ephifon or I want to use a very, very small amount because a little bit's going to go a lot farther if it's 90 degrees. In fact, if you read the label, it says, if you read the label for using it in, in cherries, it recommends that you don't use it if the temperatures get above about 85. Well, when we need to use Ethafon on cherries, what's the typical temperatures? It's usually higher than 85. So usually the, the approach is you put much lower rate on because you get it, it, it goes a lot further, okay? So, abscission control, we've talked about. Some of the fruit characteristics, fruit size and quality. Okay, one of the early examples, the real textbook example, is with grapes and gibberellic acid. This picture is actually one of my predecessors, Lamar Anderson, who's retired from Utah State a long time ago, but this was when he was a lot younger. And he's show, holding two batch, bunches of grapes. And if you zoom in, here's a bunch of grapes, here's a bunch of grapes, and they're seedless grapes. And the difference between this bunch and this bunch is this bunch got gibberellic acid applied to it. One of the problems with seedless grapes is they don't get very big on their own, okay? And the reason is the, the hormone that, that comes from the seed that tells the plant that there's a fruit there and to send energy is gibberellic acid. If you have a seedless grape, the grape doesn't want to grow very big. So if I put gibberellic acid on, it says, hey, there's a bunch of seeds here send energy for this fruit to grow, okay? So, and that's the, that's the response. Another one that's used is, and this is more uh, recent, is absizic acid. Is an, what is absizic acid involved in? Stress response. stress response, primarily drought stress response, but it was discovered that absizic acid will cause the grapes to produce the pigment a lot faster. So if you're growing red or purple grapes, you can get the color to form earlier and you can pick them when they're still more firm. So the fruit's not as ripe, but it's redder. And if you gotta have it dark red for the consumer, you can pick it a little bit on the green side, but have more color in it by applying abscisic acid. Okay, another one that's used um, is the, uh, is, you trying to get better shaped fruit. This isn't so much a problem in the in the west as it is in the east. Yeah. I have just a quick question of clear, uh, clarification. Um, in the slide before, we were talking about gibberellic acid as a way to reduce flower production, mm -hmm. ultimately pre reduce fruit production, and then just in this slide here. The use of gibberellic acid is showing that it's increasing fruit production. Do I tell me? So, what's the second slide? Question is: Is gibberellic acid increasing or decreasing fruit production? So the the second slide is that if the seedless grapes. Is that okay. So the question. Okay. So the question is: Is the gibberellic acid increasing or decreasing fruit production? And the answer is: It depends on when you apply it. Okay. If I apply gibberellic acid at the right time, I can reduce a number of flowers that are formed for next year, okay? okay? Gotcha. And, and we'll, I'm gonna talk a lot more about this point in just a few minutes, okay? So how, how would gibberellic acid have one effect at one time and another effect at another time? I'm gonna get back to that in just a minute. So one of the other, so, so promelin and Excel is, both contain both gibberellic acid and benzaladenine. And, and promelin was developed because when, when the Red Delicious was king, and thankfully that's no longer the case, but when everybody wanted to buy Red Delicious apples, they wanted to have them with big long lobes on them. What happened was it was discovered that when you grow Red Delicious in Washington or in the West, because of the environmental conditions, the fruit tends to get really nice and lobed, long blocky apples. And if, in the East, they tend to be kind of squat and flat. And the eastern growers said, hey, this isn't fair because we can't sell our apples because Washington's selling these big long ones. And if you apply promelin at the right stage of development when the fruit's really small, it actually stimulates cell division at the calyx end of the fruit until you get bigger, longer lobes. So eastern growers started using promelin so that they would get this long apple here on the bottom row versus the little squatty apple. Those are all red delicious, but they just develop differently. That's what the consumer wanted, so, so that was the, the application. 
this is actually a seedless apple. It's really small, and it has a big dose of gibberon, and so the lobes are actually bigger than the rest of the fruit because of the gibberon, or I mean the, not gibberon, promelin, the combination of gibberon and benzaladine. Then it, you get these big lobes, okay? Another, one more application, and we don't use this much here because we don't have the weather conditions, but one of the problems that you have if you're growing apples in a really humid environment is russeting. So you get these puffy looking marks on the fruit. And, and some of that we can get if we, do, if, if we do some bad management practices. But if you're in a wet, humid climate where you get lots and lots of rain, at certain stages of development, you'll get this real scuffed looking fruit on it. And the, the, the remedy for that is to put on provide, which is a different gibberellic acid, at certain stages of development, and then you and that russeting or that rough appearance goes away. The way it works is the gibberellin causes what does gibberellin do? Cell cell division, okay, cell growth. And if you if you stimulate cell division in the in the surface of the fruit, it'll the peel can expand like it's supposed to instead of getting little micro rips in it and causing the rough russet appearance, okay? That's how it works, okay? So, the question was about delaying ripening in stone fruits as opposed to apples. One product that is used for this purpose is gibberellin, okay? If you put gibberellin on cherries and peaches, it slows color development, uh, and it slows the softening process. So this is actually, for sweet cherry users, growers, this is actually a fairly common practice, particularly if you're growing the dark fruited ones, because um, for some reason, some markets, particularly export markets, they think that if a Bing cherry is really dark, then it's bad or it's overripe. So they'll actually put gibberellin on pre-harvest. It slows the pigment formation down, and so the fruit stays a lighter red, which export markets like, and the fruit stays firmer but it also gives you a little longer window to harvest the fruit before it, it gets too soft. So this is a, a, another application. There's the typical rates and timings. So for sweet cherries, it's when the fruit's straw color. Peaches, it's a few weeks before harvest. I don't know that anybody in Utah that's doing this currently, maybe some of you are. I know it's getting more popular for sweet cherries to try and expand your, your marketing window. So maybe some of you have been experimenting with this. <clears throat> so we already talked about one MCP, the ethylene blocker, how it works, why it works. So you can improve your, your storability. Typically because it's not cheap to use, you, you only do it on premium varieties that you're planning on storing for a long time, trying to hit a spring market with a, with a high quality Fuji or whatever. Um, that's really where it's, where it's used. So, um, kind of in summary, plant growth regulator classes, there's natural hormones, there's hormone analogs, there's materials that alter the levels and alter sensitivity, and here are some of the processes that we, that we use them to regulate. Any questions on that before we move on? Yes? Mm -hmm. So, you wouldn't want to use that on your late apples. So, you wouldn't want to use what? So, so, on your late apples, you wouldn't necessarily want them to hang on to the tree later. Right. Okay, so, right so the question is, on these materials that, that delay ripening, we're not going to use those on a late variety. Okay, that's, that's a good comment. So, if we're already bumping up against the end of the season, we're not going to delay it any further. Where we would use these is if, if I'm worried about a variety that I'm trying to get picked and I'm picking one block and the other block is getting a little too far gone and I'm afraid it's going to start dropping on the ground, I can buy myself a few days or a week to get it harvested. Okay, so I might use stop drop to just delay it. Or if I've got, if I've got a, an early season apple, I've got, say, an Ida red or an early gold or something, and you know, it's, it's ripening a little faster than it normally does. And I, I've got a big weekend coming up. You know, it's Labor Day weekend's coming up, and I want to have more fruit 
and I'm, I'm worried that I might miss it a little bit, I can delay that just a little bit by slowing down that process with, with some retain, okay? And I, I'll have more fruit out there for my customers to pick. But the other, the other case is if I'm gonna pick Fuji, I wanna hold it and sell it at Christmas time with my Christmas trees, or I wanna sell it for Valentine's Day, I'm gonna put, some, maybe use some Smart Fresh to, to extend the quality of that fruit further on. So that's a, a storage strategy. So it's, it depends on the market that you're trying to hit. So that's a good question. Other questions for, Tom, I guess if anybody online has a question, you get the. There you, was one question about, and I didn't get a clarification, but they wanted to know if fruit ripens at different times, how do you, even on the same tree, if fruit ripens at different times on the same tree, how do you know if it's ripening later on? So that's a, a really good question. So if, if, if I've got non-uniform ripening on a tree, how, how do I use the plant growth regulator? And that's, that's a, a complex situation and, it, and it's a battle. It's a constant battle. We've seen years, particularly with tart cherries. So one of the challenges with ethylene is the fruit has to be at a certain stage of development before it'll even respond to ethylene. If I put ethylene on a really green fruit, nothing happens. If I put it on when it's starting the ripening process and it's got receptors to respond to ethylene, then it will respond. If I wait too long and, and the cells themselves start producing their own ethylene, what ethylene has a, what's called an autocatalytic response, which means a little bit of ethylene stimulates the production of a whole lot more ethylene. And if I, so if I want to speed up the ripening, I've got to wait until that fruit's ripe enough to respond and then, and then boost it along with some methylene. If I go too early, nothing happens, okay? If I want to stop the ripening process and, I, and those cells are already autocatalytic, they're already producing their own ethylene, it's like trying to you know, show, throw a shovel full of dirt in a river to stop it. It's too late. The process is already too, too far gone. So that's a real big challenge. If I've got a tree where I've got non-uniform fruit development, some of the fruits can respond different than others. And so one of the ways that, that growers can, can combat that is directed application. Okay, if I've got fruit that I want to speed up, I, I might direct the spray at the middle part of the tree instead of the top part of the tree because the top part of the tree is further along and I'm trying to speed up the middle part of the tree. Or I might put on some, something to slow the ripening of the top part of the tree so that the middle part of the tree can catch up. I mean, those are some of the strategies, but there's no, there's no magic bullet answer. You, you've got to think about how that material is working and whether or not it's going to respond and how I might direct it at the part of the tree that I want to. Okay? Other questions before we move on? Yeah, Tom. Does retain make it harder to pick apples? Does retain make it harder to pick? Well, it's going to make the, it's going to make the abscission layer a little bit tougher, okay? But... You, you're still you're still going to apply the force. It's it's not you, when you're yanking it off the plant. It's not noticeable. But it's enough that if you have a windstorm, all the fruit's not going to drop on the ground. Okay. One more. What happens if you make it stuff above the bud without applying PGR? Good question. So the the question there, if what happens if I make the cut above a bud without applying additional PGR? So. By just the cut alone, I'm gonna disrupt auxin, which is controlling that apical dominance, which is keeping that bud dormant. But if I don't apply the PGR, the amount of growth that I get on that branch that breaks might be, not be enough to, to make it worth my while. What I'm trying to do with that whole strategy, I'm, I'm trying to establish this cherry tree and I'm trying to get long fruiting branches. And if I cut, if I make that cut, that bud might just break and grow three or four leaves and, and it's worthless to me. I'm trying to get a fruiting branch there. So by applying the gibberellin and the, the cytokinin, I'm gonna boost the growth of that shoot so it gets big enough that I can, I can do something with it. Good questions. Okay, should we move on from there then? So let's talk about fruit thinning a little bit. Okay, so the strategy here with fruit thinning is that, again, we've kind of alluded to this, but let's just restate the obvious just a little bit. Flower buds form during the previous season, okay? That's why I've been, it's successful to put gibberellins on to suppress those, okay? But developing fruit inhibits further flower buds. So in the case of apples, 
and some varieties are a lot worse at this than others, you get biennial bearing, where if a spur on an apple tree is producing a fruit one year, it doesn't make a flower bud for the next year. And if all the spurs on the tree get synchronized so that they're all trying to produce fruit one year, what happens the next year? You get no bloom, all right? So the whole idea, one, two, two objectives of thinning, one is, I want to reduce the number of fruits so that the fruit that remains gets big enough that I can actually have something I can market. Nobody wants little dinky fruit. You want good sized fruit. So I've got to reduce the number of fruit to get the size that I need, but I also need to reduce the number of fruit so that I don't suppress flowering for the next year, okay? And what's the, what's the signal that suppresses the flowering? What's the hormone? Gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid is produced by the seed, and it goes back to the plant, and it gives two signals to the plant. One is, there's seed here, send resources so this fruit can grow. The other is, don't make flower buds for next year. Okay, so competing things, signals. So by applying gibberellins to seedless grapes, I'm telling the grape plant, hey, there's seeds here, make the fruit bigger, even though there's not seed. By, but in the case of, and in the case of cherries, I'm saying, you know, make more flower, don't make so many flower buds, okay? So I can use it both ways, but that's the, the, that's the mechanism. So in thinning, I, I've got two objectives. So the first objective, if I look, and, and it's a simple mathematical equation, if I want the fruit to get big, and I want the sugar content high enough that somebody wants to eat that fruit, and the color development high enough that it's gonna look good on the shelf, I've got to have a certain number of leaves per fruit. The leaves are providing the energy for that demand. There's not enough energy, there's not enough growth. And so this is a little different by variety, kind of as a typical thing, and you can't hardly see the numbers on this graph, and I apologize. This is number of leaves per fruit, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. This is the size of the fruit, the volume of the finished fruit. And there's a point of no return. Once I get up, in this case, about 30 leaves per fruit, that, now there's, there's more energy than that fruit can really, you know, really need, and so the, the growth kind of tapers off, okay? But as I go below that, the, the fruit size gets smaller and smaller because there's just not enough leaves. Now, what's the optimum for an apple? The answer is it depends on the variety, it depends on what you're trying to do, okay? I can make a honey crisp grow huge, be completely covered with bitter pit, but that's not what I want. I want it smaller. Whereas with the gala, that gala doesn't really want to grow, and so I got to have a lot more leaves to get the gala big enough to, to hit the, the market. So it depends on the variety and what I'm trying to do. Another way that we can think about crop load isn't just the number of leaves, but the amount of vascular tissue that's, that's supplying it. Think of it a, Think of the branch as a pipeline, and it's bringing nutrients and water to that fruit. And so it, you can actually think of it as a pipeline and calculate it accordingly. So if I look at the trunk diameter, this is, a, this is a kind of just a conversion table. So the first column there is trunk diameter in inches, what that equates to in centimeters. And then if you think about a pipe, how much can I put through a pipe? It has to do with the volume of that pipe, the, the area of that pipe, right? And we can think about the tree in the same way. This branch is a pipeline. How big is the pipeline? And if I think about the number of apples per centimeter squared of pipeline, that's actually a really good way to think about how much that tree can support. Once I start pruning and whacking off parts of the pipe, it's different, but on a young branch, that diameter is a good indication of what that fruit can, can handle. Okay, so here it's saying optimum crop load is seven to eight fruit per centimeter squared of branch. Well, again, that depends on what I'm trying to do. I might want to have more than that if I'm growing a honey crisp, but I don't want the fruit to blow up like a softball and be covered with, with bitter pit. But in the case, if, I, if I'm trying to hit 80 count galas, I've got to push them a lot harder. I'm going to need fewer 
fruit per centimeter squared to get the size that I'm after. Okay, so you're going to have to adjust that from year to year and from variety to variety. Another thing to think about is that there's genetic differences in the potential of a fruit to grow big. All right, so if you go out there and look at an apple cluster at bloom, you got a king bloom in the middle, it opens first, and then you got a whirl of laterals around it. Well, genetically, that king bloom has the potential to be a bigger apple than the laterals. So when I'm thinning, if, if that fruit is small genetically, it doesn't matter what I do, it's, it's gonna be smaller at harvest than if I started with, it, with the one that had a bigger potential. So that's a thing to consider. When I thin, I'm hoping that I take off the ones that are, are prone to be small and leaving the ones that are prone to be big, okay? So once it's, if it starts out small, it's always gonna be small. Another objective obviously with, with thinning is I wanna get good color formation. If I've got multiple fruits crammed together in a cluster, I don't get co good color formation where the fruits are touching because there's just not enough light exposure. So thinning can get me a better uh, color exposure in addition to the leaf to fruit ratio. Okay, so we already talked about this. So what the, the mechanism there is, is seed produced hormones and under, if you leave a tree to its own devices, some of that fruit's gonna drop off. If I look at this picture, there's fruit here that are small and they're not gonna compete. These have some seeds in them, they're gonna grow big. Some of these are gonna drop off on their own. What I'm trying to do with, with hormones is I'm gonna try and stimulate that process even more and get more of those to drop off naturally during June drop and, and leave fewer, okay? So we've already talked about the, the size effect, but the return bloom effect. The longer I wait to thin, the, le the, the less chance I'm gonna get return bloom. Because why? Because the, the blooms are forming. If I wait till the blooms are formed, it's too late, okay? So this, this graph shows days after full bloom, and when, um, when those blossoms are forming, okay? So the longer I wait, the less effect I get. Most of them are happening within 30 to 40 days after bloom, and if I wait beyond that, there's not much forming. So I've got to, if I'm gonna thin, I gotta do it with before this stage comes along because then it's too late. I wanna get return bloom, so I gotta have them thinned in time. So that's one of the challenges, that's why using a plant growth regulator to thin is, is a lot more effective because I can do that before it would ever be practical to do it by hand, right? So some of the thinning agents, naphthalene acetic acid comes as frutone, it's also NAA 800 or something like that, I can't remember the, the other names of the formulation. NAD is another one that's used. Uh, carbaryl or seven is a thinning agent. Ethafon can be used, benzyl adenine is used. Here's the chemical structure of some of these. So here's NAA, it's got this benzene type ring and then it's got a side chain on it. NAD is very similar, the only difference is it's got a little bit different side chain here. So this is naphthalene acetic acid, naphthalene acetamide, and this is carbaryl. What's carbaryl used for? It's an insecticide, but guess what? It's also a plant hormone analog. It's a lot similar to auxins, okay? Very similar. Here's benzylidine down here. It looks completely different. It's a completely different structure because it's a cytokinin. So I kind of put that in. To, so how some of these are used. Naphthalene acetamide, I don't know many of you grow use this. And one of the reasons is it's more effective on early season apples. If you're growing hollow reds or early gold or some of the really early, early apples, the NAD works better than NAA. Most of you guys that are growing apples, I know don't, I mean, your earliest what, maybe Gala? And Gala will respond better to NAA. So NAA is really the typical uh, thinning agent for post bloom and carbaryl or seven, okay? One of the advantages to NAA is it's the return bloom is disproportionate relative to the thinning. In other words, it actually promotes f return bloom more than it thins. That's actually a good thing, right? Because I want to get return bloom. One of the 
downsides to NAA is it's, it's very environmentally dependent. We've been using NAA for since the 1940s as a thinning agent, and it's always kind of a, a little variable. And it's been known for a long time that under high temperatures, you get over thinning. And under high light conditions, you get under thinning. And I'm gonna talk a lot about this when I get towards the end of the session today, what we, we finally think we figured out why this is the case. But this is true of not just NA, but a lot of the plant growth regulators is they're really dependent on environmental conditions. The other one is Max Cell. Roger talked to, when I picked on him early, he talked about it. It's, it, it stimulates fruit growth. It can be used as a thinner, but its effect on fruit size is disproportionate to the amount of fruit you remove. In other words, the fruit grows more than you would expect based on the number of fruit that you removed, which is, can be a good thing if I'm trying to size up some genetically small fruit. It's not a real strong thinner. It usually doesn't take enough fruit off by itself. So typically, it's used in combination with a seven. So you use seven to knock a lot of the fruit off. You use Maxell to get those fruit to size more than they would with seven alone, okay? So that's kind of the approach. There's different stages that we can attack this. We can go with bloom thinners. NAA can be used as a bloom thinner. NAA and carbaryl at 10, eight to 12 millimeters. So one of the ways you time a thinning spray is you go out and measure the, the diameter of the king fruit in millimeters and I, and I time it accordingly. Some of them you can do on about five to six millimeters, which is when they're just, you can just see that they've got seeds and they're starting to form. A lot of them are about 10 millimeters, about like that. Um, once you get out to about, beyond about 16, 18 millimeters, a lot of them don't respond so well. You gotta be a lot more aggressive. You gotta use a higher dose or something that's a little stronger to get the response. So one of the approaches you can use is you can go out and assess bloom and say, I've got way, way, way too much bloom at here. I've got the bee activity is good. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get way more set than I need. So I'm gonna do something really early, knock some of them off now, and then I'm gonna come back a little later and hit them again. I might hit them again. I might do all of these. I might hit them at bloom. I might hit them a little after petal fall with, with something. And each time I'm assessing what kind of response I got so that I, because I can't afford to blow this. Because if I blow this, I get no flowers next year. And I can't afford to not have a crop next year. So I've got to be aggressive. Okay? And again, this is more of a problem in varieties that tend to be more, bi more biennial. Um, so I asked a question on the pretest. Let's go back there. This is another of my trick questions. All of the following products have been used as fruit thinning agents in Utah. Utah. Which of these is not considered a plant growth regulator? Most of you picked seven because you know that sevens are uh, insecticide. But what did I just tell you? Seven acts as an auxin. The real answer is tergitol. Tergitol is a soap, okay? And if I apply a soap, it's a really strong detergent, basically, what it is. And tergitol is used at bloom. And the idea is with using tergitol, and it's not the only one, there's a whole bunch of them, is if I apply it at bloom, it will burn some of the blossoms before they can get pollinated. And if they get burned and can't get pollinated, they don't form a fruit. So it's a bloom time thinner. It's not acting as a growth hormone, it's acting as a, a physical block of, of um, so the, the correct answer is tergitol. CERT7 actually acts as a growth regulator. So some of the other caustic bloom thinners besides tergitol is ammonium thiosulfate or ATS. We used to use a product called Elgitol back in the 80s and it was banned because it was quite toxic to the environment. It did the same thing, it just burned flowers. There's, ATS is actually a foliar fertilizer. It's ammonium, it's a nitrogen source, and sulfur, which is, a, and if I apply it during bloom as a, as a fertilizer, I can burn some of the flowers and reduce my bloom. This is actually one that's used sometimes as a, and, and others as organic approaches, okay? So it's a different approach. I'm not, I'm not affecting fruit set after the fact, I'm just burning, it's a physical process. 
How many of you are familiar with Darwin thinners? You've seen those in the magazines and stuff? Chris, what's a Darwin thinner? Looks like a, a big weed eater on steroids, and you go through it, bloom, and it just knocks blossoms off the tree. Same idea. I'm going to knock the blossom off before it can form a fruit. I don't. I use a Darwin thinner after the fruit forms. It won't knock the fruit off anymore, and it just stuffs up the fruit. So it's a it's a physical process as opposed to a physiological process. Would dormant oil also be something that would burn? Flowers. Dormant oil can be used. I've heard of oil applications used as, as a thinning agent. So the philosophy there, so the question is, can you use dormant oil as a thinner? It, the answer is, it's the same approach. What I'm trying to do, in theory, is I'm trying to wait until the king blooms, the first blooms that open, have already been pollinated. Okay? I'm waiting till they're beyond the, the, the process of pollination, and then I'm going to burn all the later blooms off because... The later blooms produce smaller fruit anyway. Why would I not want to do this? For honey crust. I might lose, I might overdo it. If, I, if my timing's off, I might overdo it. I might lose too many blossoms. What else can happen about the time that I'm halfway through bloom? Okay. On which? Okay, so the, the approach, again, like with any crisp or any other variety, the approach with the soaps and oils is I'm trying to knock the late flowers off. One of the reasons that I might not want to do this is we are prone to frost, okay? If I go out and I burn a bunch of blossoms off, and then I get a frost that kills the ones that are already pollinated, I end up with nothing. In fact, there was a study done a few years ago by one of the, it was actually in cooperation with the University of Idaho, but a couple of growers in Utah were using tergitol as a thinner on peaches. What they found is that, yes, I can get bloom thinning on peaches, but the peaches that remain on the trees that got treated with tergitol are actually more prone to frost than if I didn't use it. So the frost gets causes more damage. So I would not recommend this if you're in an area where frost is, where you're frost prone, okay? Typically, the, the early bloom thinning, you want to be really careful. If you're in a spot that you've got an excellent spot that's very low likelihood of frost, then you'll probably see her, but that's always a risk that you're going to run. So yes, good, good comment. Okay. So we've talked about this. We've known for 75 years that we can use NAA as a thinning agent, but we still get inconsistent responses. So I showed you that graph that said, well, if it's hot, it responds one way. If it's cool, it responds another way. If it's um, sunny, it responds. Well, there's, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. So what I want to do with, with the next little bit of time that I have is talk about some of the factors and how you need to be thinking about these so that you can manage around them and get uh, a consistent, predictable response that you can live with, okay? And some of them are temperature related, but some of them are, are more typical management related. So let's talk about these. I, the, the additional reading that I provided is actually a, a book chapter that was written years ago by a guy that has my same name and was a lot younger. It was actually me, but I was, years ago we wrote a book on all of these different factors. So if you want to get into more of the detail, that book has it, but um, I'm not going to go into every one of them. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. So you have to think about, I've got to get the plant growth regulator on the plant. Okay, that's the delivery from the spray tank to the end of the target. I've got to get it inside the target and to the type part of the plant that needs to respond. And then I've got to have the plant respond the way I want it to respond. And all of these can be variable. So it gets to be complex. So delivery is important. Plant growth regulators, so hormones can move in the plant. But if I'm going to apply a growth regulator, oftentimes it doesn't move very far. Or if it does move very far, what, to get the response that I want, I've got to put it where I want it to respond. Because it moves in the plant, but it doesn't move very far. So it's kind of a localized thing. It's also a narrow acceptable dose range. Remember we talked about flower suppression in cherries, I, I want to knock the 
flowering back 20%. You don't want to walk, knock it back 100%. So it's, it's a narrow dose range. If I overshoot, I get a bad response. If I undershoot, I don't get any response. So I've got to hit that target. So what this means is I've got to get uniform distribution and I've got to get uptake by the plant. So some of the factors that you need to think about as an orchard manager are the design of your sprayer. Okay, we've got sprayers like this one that have the, the round plenum that sprays out in a fan shape. We've got the, more and more people are using a tower type sprayer that's moving the spray horizontally across the plant. We talked earlier about what happens if I want to put more of the material on the top of the tree versus the bottom of the tree. This is going to be a little trickier. This, I, can, I can put larger orifice nozzles up near the top and smaller ones at the bottom, or I can shut off some of those nozzles so that less spray is going into the bottom of the tree and more spray is going in the top, or vice versa. I can control where I put that spray with the spray pattern. Okay, there's, so here's a couple of designs. The other thing you have to think about besides just the pattern of the spray is the air velocity and volume that moves through the plant. So this, this, is, this ag tech has one type of system, this is a Kurtec. Some of you have probably, I know a few of you have Kurtecs. How many of you have AgTech type sprayers? Anybody? Okay. So these work very differently. This one has a, like, it looks like a squirrel cage fan right in here. It pushes the air out and then it comes out through a really narrow slot. So I'm pointing to the, the top diagram there, the AgTech sprayer. There, just where the word AgTech is, is where the fan is. And then it's coming out through the, these narrow slots. The Kurtec, the one on the bottom, has these big fans that push large volume of air. So the whole purpose of the air is to carry the droplet into the tree where it can be deposited on a leaf or on a fruit. That's the whole purpose. But these two sprayers use very different philosophies in how they do that. AgTech puts out very low, relatively low quantity of air. The air is going very, very fast. The Kurtec is at the complete opposite end of the extreme. It's pushing out a whole bunch of air, but it's uh, at a lower speed. Okay? Each of those, and then these other sprayers that I have are somewhere in between. So each of these has its advantages and disadvantages. If I push a, a smaller volume of air out at a very high speed, it doesn't go very far. But the distance it goes, it's very turbulent. It's turbulent. Swirling. Swirling. Okay? okay. If I push out a large volume of air, air at a lower speed, speed, it tends to come out and farther and farther out. Okay? okay? So if I'm spraying a tree, I'm going to go every other every, every, every row, every row this low volume low air, air is really good because it's swirling through the small tree and get the backside to the other thing else. If I'm using this Kurtec, I can go every second or third row, and I'm, I'm getting distribution, but I've got to, I've got to go from both sides. So one pass, I'm spraying one side of two or three rows, and as I come down the other side, I get the other side of those two or three rows, okay? It's a very different strategy. Last couple of weeks ago, I don't know how many um, Good Fruit Grower magazine, there's an article in there on spoilers, and this picture was in it, and it talks about high speed, low speed air, and what the effect is. High speed air, these are the white streaks, they, they, there's light shining, and they've sprayed droplets, and you can see where the droplets are going. The high speed air, droplets are shooting past, not getting backside coverage. In low speed air, it's swirling back, and some of the droplets are, are dropping on the backside, okay? So there's... There's how the droplets end up landing on the plant on the plant differ with that as well. Okay, but typically with the examples I used before, this high speed sprayer is very turbulent. It's very sw much swirling. Okay, the other thing that comes into play from these same things is how the droplet forms. The AgTech has a little plate. And the, and the solution dribbles out across the plate, and as it comes off the end of the plate, the air shears the, the droplet off, and it goes through the air. Okay? These, the, the Kurtec has a rotary nozzle that it's actually, the hydraulics of the tractor spin the nozzle, and it throws the 
solution out through a screen. And then this one on the bottom left has just a, a hydraulic spray nozzle that's been released. Each of these nozzles tends to make droplets of different sizes, okay? And a big droplet, if it's, a big droplet is more, if it's too big, it's more likely to hit the leaf and just splash off or break apart into a bunch of small droplets. And if it's too small of a droplet, it tends to go right around the fruit, just like that picture we showed. And really small droplets, they just go zipping right through the plant and out the other side. Whereas if they're just right, it's the Goldilocks syndrome. If they're just right, they're gonna hit the leaf and stick or they're gonna hit the fruit and stick, okay? So these are things that you need to be thinking about. Okay, spray pattern. We already talked about this. One of, the, one of the reasons that this becomes critical, this is actually a project I did years and years ago. We looked at um, a sprayer that was kind of this round plenum type, but it was too small for the orchard. It was too small. It wasn't really well designed for that size of tree. And what happened was we got about three to five times more spray in the outside lower part of the tree than we did in the top center of the tree. Okay, three to five times more spray was getting onto those leaves than in the middle of the tree. What does that mean? Well, the way the grower was using it is he was putting out high volume sprays. He was putting out 250 gallons to the acre. And when he oversprayed the lower part of the tree, all the excess just ran off onto the ground and he was okay. But if he oversprayed the, just really oversprayed the outside lower part of the tree, he was getting enough in the inside part of the tree to get good coverage for pest management or whatever else. So it was working for him. It wasn't working well, but it was working for him, okay? But what happened was when he went to use a lower volume spray and said, hey, I don't wanna spray 200 gallons to the acre. I wanna spray 80 gallons to the acre. Now, instead of everything dripping off, it stuck. And in the case of a growth regulator, he was either underdosing the middle of the tree or he was overdosing the outside lower part of the tree. And if, I get, if I'm using a growth regulator and I overdose, I have problems. I might get, you know, I might get leaf drop instead of fruit drop if I'm using Athafon. Or I might get, in the case of NAA, I might get over thinning. Or I might get what they call pygmy fruit. If NAA overdose it you'll get in certain varieties the fruit just stops growing and you get it stays on till harvest so you have all these little red delicious that are about 20 millimeters in diameter so moral of the story is you've got to have the, the, the sprayer to match the tree and in some cases it's it's better to use a high volume spray than a low volume spray when i'm using plant growth regulators because my margin of error is better if i if I go a little off on the dose, the excess is going to run off the leaves and I'm not going to get a, a negative response, okay? Oftentimes when we, we're using growth regulators for thinning or else we're using high volume sprays, number one, to get good coverage through the whole canopy, and number two, to prevent overdosing. Sorry, I got to take a quick drink. Okay, so those are kind of the messages. Another thing that we need to think about are the spray solution characteristics. One of the problems that we have, well, there's a couple of things. Some of our growth regulators are sensitive to UV light. So how long they stay active on the surface of the plant depends on how much sunlight we have. So what's the solution to that? Do it at night. Do it at night. Spray at night so that I don't have UV breakdown. NAA is really prone to UV breakdown. So if I spray in the middle of the day on a bright sunny day, a lot of that material that's on the outside of the canopy is gonna degrade before it ever even gets into the plant, okay? Volatilization, 2,4-D is actually, the, the, the herbicide is actually a auxin. It's very closely related to NAA. The way it kills weeds is it causes them to grow to death. So. 2,4-D is volatile, and some of the other plant growth regulators can be volatile as well. So you got to be careful about that. Degradation due to pH. So most of the growth regulators are organic acids. And what makes an acid is this little side chain. So I'm pointing to the, to the diagram on the left. It's got the, the ring, and then it says CH2, and then the C. This little thing that's connected to the C is what makes that an organic acid. 
This is the organic part. This is the acid part, okay? When I put an acid in water solution, some of the acid dissociates. It drifts apart. And what happens is the hydrogen falls off. And I get this big molecule that has a negative charge and a little positively charged hydrogen. The amount of organic acid that falls apart is a function of the pH of the solution that it's in. The higher the pH, the more of it is in this form on the right hand side. What's the pH of your water at your spray shed? Anybody know? What's the pH of your irrigation water? Anybody know? Probably it could be high sevens, could be high eight. Anything above seven is going to promote this kind of business, okay? So why does that matter? Well, not only does it drift, the hydrogen drift off, but this whole molecule will start breaking down at high pHs. That's bad news. But the other thing is, when I have this little negative charge sticking out there, that means that that molecule will not go through the cuticle of a plant. It'll just sit on the surface. It cannot go through as a charged molecule. So if I put this into solution and my spray tank pH is 7.8, most of the NAA is going to be in this dissociated form and it won't go through the leaf no matter what. Okay? If I put in a buffer to lower the pH of my spray tank, most of the NAA is going to be in this form over here where the hydrogen's still on it and it will go through the leaf. So the moral of the story is what? It's adjust your pH. Use a spray tank buffer. Okay? Tanya, there's a question online. Are there any concerns with bees with the sprays? Carbaryl, absolutely. Okay? Because it's an insecticide. The others are not toxic to bees whatsoever. The other growth regulators are not. Car Carbaryl is one. So another reason that we spray thinners at night is honeybees aren't active at night, so we're less likely to impact them. So good question. So the, the moral of the story is I want this, and so I've got to put a buffer in. One of the common ones, actually you can actually use ammonium sulfate, which will act as a very mild, weak buffer. And so oftentimes you'll see like 2,4-D or glyphosate or any of those, they'll say, add some ammonium sulfate and it is actually more effective. You increase uptake. Part of the reason you increase uptake is you keep that organic acid together and keep it from drifting apart. But trifol is one. The, some of you guys I know get um, Earl Seeley's recommendations. He'll oftentimes say, add this at 200 gallons per acre and a pint per 100 gallons and put a pint of trifol in. Trifol is a buffer. It's gonna keep the pH of your spray solution down there so that your, your growth regulators don't dissociate and degrade, okay? So, my, so another factor that comes into play is the surface tension or the viscosity of the solution. So surface tension, if I put water, this is a drop of water with some food coloring in it so you can see it, sitting on the surface of an apple leaf. What's all this down here? Well, those are the trichomes or the hairs on the bottom surface of a leaf. How much of that is coming in contact with the leaf? Not much of it. I mean, it's contacting a few leaf hairs and that's it. If I put a, if this had plant growth regulator in it, it's not gonna go into the plant like I want it to, okay? Here is, here's the same picture from farther away. This is the lower surface of a leaf. This is the solution. Um, just the water and the coloring. This has 0.01% of a surfactant or a surface active agent, which is gonna cause that droplet to spread out, okay? And here's 0.1%, so it's gonna drop out even more. So number one, it's gonna cause that droplet to stick to the leaf better. Number two, it's gonna cause that droplet to spread out, contact a larger surface of the leaf so that more of that growth regulator is gonna get into the leaf, okay? Here's, this is actually a poinsettia with same amount of spray solution on the leaf. You can see the droplets and they've all kind of pulled up along where the vein is. Here's got the same amount, but it's spread out across the leaf so you could just, it just kind of looks wet. Now, you have to be careful because too much 
of a good thing will cause that to just run off the end of the leaf and be lost. You've, you've decreased the surface tension to the point where it just runs off. So here's, this is actually NAA in a solution. We put it on, took an took a electron micrograph and you can see a lot of that NAA is stuck, like snow drifts stuck up in the trichome. So by putting that surfactant on, I'm spreading it across the leaf. So here's back to one of the pre-test questions. <clears throat> Plant growth regulators come formulated with, quote, inert ingredients, unquote, that are actually not inert, but combinations of preservatives, surfactants, and buffers. Which of these should you add to the spray tank in addition to the, the growth regulator? The answer is definitely buffer. I mean, definitely buffers. In our water, in our conditions, you, you want to always add a buffer. Sometimes they need a surfactant, sometimes they don't. I'll give you an example. Okay, so NAA comes as frutone. It's a dry formulation, there's no surfactant in it. But the NAA, what is it, 8800 or whatever, the, the liquid formulation, oftentimes that comes with a surfactant. You, a little bit of surfactant goes a long, long, long way. So if I'm putting in a pint of, of NAA in a spray tank, it may have enough surfactant, I don't need to add more. It may already have enough, but I always want to add that buffer because without that buffer, my material is going to degrade. So read the label. Oftentimes the, growth, the, the labels will mention use a non-ionic surfactant or in some cases you don't need to. Also, trial and error a little bit on your farm. Keep track of what you did. You know, you, you, if, you didn't, if you want to get a little bigger response, you may want to add a little surfactant or you may not, okay? Back to one of Earl's recommendations. This was from last year, I pulled it up. He says one pint per 100 gallons of trifle and half a pint of either R11 or S90. R11 and S90 are surfactants. They're non-ionic surfactants. That's this, what's gonna cause that better, um, reduced surface tension and better wetting. Again, depends on the material. Some materials may need it, some may not. Okay. Target characteristics come into play, okay? What's the tree form? What's the, the, the shape of the tree that I'm trying to cover? Again, this goes back to matching your sprayer to the tree so that you can get the uniform distribution that you need. But also comes into play the surface characteristics. I've already shown you a picture of an apple leaf with all these massive trichomes. There's the surface leaf way down in there. And you've got this jungle of, of, of uh, trichomes or hairs. This is actually a pear leaf, and pear gets this really thick, rough wax on it. And the longer that plant's been there, the thicker the wax gets. Well, all of the hormones that I put on there, all the growth regulators I put on there, if I want it to have an effect, it's got to go through that wax and get into the leaf. And so that can affect my response. If I've got a plant that's been grown under hot, dry conditions and the wax layer is really thick, and I put a surfactant on, I mean, I put a growth regulator on, it's gonna have a harder time getting in than if that's a young leaf that hasn't been through hot, dry, drought stress conditions and the, the wax layer is gonna be thinner. So all these things come into play. Okay, how do they respond? Well, plants differ in their sensitivity. Part of this sensitivity difference has to do with the time of year, okay? If I'm gonna suppress flower formation, I've got to put it on when the flowers are forming. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? It says if I do proper timing with this rate, 60% inhibition, too early or too late, I might only get 20%. I might get zero inhibition. Okay, different tissues on the same tree respond differently. We did a study, this was a study I did years ago when I worked in Michigan, where we looked at how the apple fruit responds to a thinning agent if it's a king fruit or if it's a lateral fruit. And the answer is they respond differently. Lateral fruits, are, are, their sensitivity to growth regulators is different than a king fruit, okay? So if I, if I have a late or a spring frost that kills my king bloom, but my lateral bloom comes out and I get a bunch of laterals and no king, then the thinning response is gonna be different. It's gonna maybe even be harder to thin than if I had a king there and I'm just knocking the laterals off because that king is already dominant over those laterals. So those are some of the things that you have to think about too. 
and then exposure to other growth regulators. Sometimes, and this is a bigger problem in the East than it is here, but if I've applied one thinning agent and then I come back with another, how easily it responds to the second one is a function of whether or not it saw the first one earlier, okay? I'm not gonna talk about that, but it is in that chapter. Tree health, a weak tree responds different than a really healthy, strong tree. One cultivar responds different than another. So how can I manage around all this? Well, one way I can do it is keep good records of what I did one year and how well it worked so that next year when I go back and look and say, well, that was more than I wanted, I can adjust it on a block-by-block -block basis, variety by variety. Okay, weather conditions. I talked about this earlier. One of the things, and this is, this is kind of concluding, I know Tad's over here chomping at the bit to share his wisdom and knowledge with you, so I'm going to... I'm going to wind down here. One of the things that we found, and this was, we're not the only ones that did this, but we were looking at how some of these thinning agents might actually work. And one of the things we kind of stumbled upon was that this is with NAA. So this is a study we did. This is on Red Delicious in Michigan. We applied NAA at different rates, and then we measured the photosynthetic rate of the plant. And it turns out that NAA actually inhibits photosynthesis for some reason. We haven't quite figured out why, but we know that it does. And some of these other thinning agents do as well. They actually slow down the photosynthesis of the plant. Well, you remember earlier I showed you that graph that said at certain temperatures, NAA is more effective and at certain light conditions. Well, over the last 10 years or so, there's been some really interesting work on thinning and growth regulators. But it started out with this guy. This, his name's Alan Lack. So he was at Cornell University, recently retired. What he did is he would go out at different times of the year and put a big plastic balloon over the top of an apple tree and measure photosynthesis and respiration. So photosynthesis, remember, from third grade biology is you're taking CO2 from the air, using light energy, and converting it to sugar. Okay, that's photosynthesis. Respiration is taking sugar and, and getting the energy out of it and releasing CO2. Well, which ones do fruit trees do? They do both. It's not a trick question. They do both. They're using photosynthesis to, to, to generate sugars, but they're using sugars to fuel growth, okay? And during the day, they're doing more photosynthesis than they're doing respiration, so the net movement is CO2 into the plant, okay? At night, when the sun's not shining, they, respire, they still continue to respire, but the CO2 goes out and they're burning the energy to grow roots, to grow new leaves, to grow wood, to store sugar in the fruit, all this happens, okay. So he was interested in photosynthesis and respiration of fruit trees at different times of the year. And so he studied it year after year, looked at um, how leaf area affected it, how the photosynthetic capacity of the leaf affected it. That was the supply. The demand was how fast is it growing, so how much carbon does it need to, to fuel the root growth that's going on right now? How much carbon does it need to f fuel the leaf growth? And was able to, based on the weather conditions and the size of the tree, predict how much that tree was really doing. And it was based on empire trees, which is they grow a lot of in New York, on a tall spindle system. And what he found is something kind of interesting. Sometimes that tree is running a, car a net carbon deficit. It's respiring faster than it's photosynthesizing. And so it's pulling stored carbon out of reserves, out of reserves in the roots, out of reserves in the leaves, to keep going, okay? And sometimes it's running a surplus. So it's photosynthesizing much faster than it's needing the carbon for growth. So that carbon is going into stored reserves in the bark, stored reserves in the trunk, stored reserves in the roots, and in the fruit. But what was really interesting that they kind of stumbled upon as they were doing this was as they were doing it, they did a thinning study. <clears throat> and so this, these dots are the application of thinning compounds uh, at different times. And what they found, okay, so this year, so this, the, the dots, the, the units there are percent of unthinned. So if I get the lower the number, the more thinning I got, okay? The higher the number, the less thinning I got. So here, 
they're about 40%, so they've taken 60% of the fruit off with that application. Later in the season, they were getting much less of a response. And when they looked at how that tree was growing, they discovered that when that tree is running a surplus of carbon, if it's got more energy than it needs, it doesn't respond very well to a thinning agent. And if it doesn't have enough, it over-responds. Well, what, why would that work? Well, it kind of stands to reason. If I tell the tree, you got way too many fruit here, you don't have enough energy to fuel that fruit, the tree drops the fruit on the ground during that June drop. It's a self-regulating process. So what they've come up with is a series of recommendations. Here's the next year, so this is one year. Here's another year. They got huge amounts of thinning. They knocked the fruit load down to 40% of a full bloom. I'm looking at the lower graph, those lower dots. And what's happening at the time is that this line, this bouncing back and forth, is running a net deficit. It's, it's 60 grams per day short of the carbon that it needs based on photosynthesis and respiration. So the thinning response is really strong. That plant needs more carbon, it's gonna drop its fruit, okay? So they came up with a recommendation. First of all, they programmed all this, um, this model of carbon balance into a, the weather stations. So if you have a weather station on your farm, you can go on and say, oh, is it running a carbon balance? You know, is it deficit or, and they said, if, it's, if you're running a surplus, you better increase the amount of growth regulator that you put on is your thinning application because that tree's not going to be very responsive. Okay, if you're running a slight deficit, use the standard rate of thinner. If you're running a big deficit, 60 to 80 grams per day of carbon per tree, which is, you can call it whatever, the units aren't important. If this deficit is, is strong, then that tree's going to respond really easily. So I'm going to cut my rate of thinner way down because I'm going to get a, it's going to go a lot farther. It's going to be a lot more effective. So they're using this to, to, to kind of think about how much thinner. Well, we don't have this set. Of, well, so the next question is, does that really work for us? So this was designed for empire trees in upstate New York. So some other researchers got really interested. They took the same system to Chile and to New Zealand, and it didn't work because in New Zealand and in Chile, they never run a deficit. That tree is always running a surplus, which is why New Zealand grows big apples because their trees are always in a surplus stage. So I was curious a few years ago and I got these guys to run some data from Utah and said, do we ever run a surplus or a deficit? So the first year I took data from the weather station out at West Mountain, had them run the model, and for most of the bloom period, and, and after bloom, so this is your thinning period from, from bloom out to about 20, 25 days post bloom. We're running a 40, 60, 80 gram per day surplus, which means what? Hard to thin, okay? I'm gonna have to hit them hard and hit them hard again to get them to thin, okay? And this is what they're finding in New Zealand and Chile is that all the time they're running these huge surpluses. But if we did it the next year, whoops, sorry. This was the same weather station the next year. We were running a 60, 80 gram deficit there for a couple of days. Okay, so let's think about this for just a minute. What would cause a surplus versus what would cause a deficit? Well, the biggest factor is what? Sunshine, overcast. One year it was bright sunlight. The, the one thing we typically have in Utah is bright, sunny conditions. But if I've got low light, really overcast, okay, if I have it up here, I'm in trouble at where it says zero because if it's overcast and rainy, the bees stay in the hive and I don't get good pollination. But if I'm 10 days, 15 days after bloom, and I've got really overcast conditions, one of the things that's going to happen is that tree is going to run a carbon deficit which means it's gonna be a lot more responsive to that thinning material and it's gonna drop more fruit, okay? So a big one is, um, is light conditions. The other one though is interestingly enough, one of the reasons that we typically run a surplus and one of the reasons that the Chileans typically run a surplus is we have big day-night temperature fluctuations. We have 
warm sunny days, which really promotes a lot of photosynthesis. We have cold nights, which really slows down respiration. So our fruit, the reason our fruit's sweeter than the, the reason the bricks in our cherries is higher than the bricks in Michigan, our night temperatures are cool. Their night temperatures are warm. They respire off a lot of the carbon that we don't respire. So if I have, if I, for some weird reason, the temperature stays hot at night, then my respiration is going to go up and I'm more likely to run a deficit. That's why this is a bigger problem or a bigger issue in, say, New York and Michigan than it is here. So I, I, I'm just throwing these out for you to start to think about some of the processes that you need to keep in mind as you're planning to use growth regulators. Okay, so one of the challenges though is you gotta, actually the, the thinning response isn't the deficit at the time you apply it, but the deficit over the next three or four days. So I could, we could program your weather stations to tell you what the deficit or, or surplus is over the last five days, but that wouldn't necessarily tell you how effective your thinning application was. You would need to know what the surplus or deficit was gonna be for the next three days. So what's the moral of the story? If you're gonna have overcast, really overcast conditions versus really bright sunny conditions, over the next three or four days, you adjust your rates accordingly. Okay, so just in summary, two, two slides. Let's just go over these. So you need to consider delivery, uptake, response. How am I gonna get it to the plant uniformly? How am I gonna get it into the plant? And, and what are the factors that I need to think about? I need to make sure I'm using a, a sprayer that's designed to match the tree that I'm trying to apply to. And if the farther I get from that ideal, the more difficult that challenges I'm gonna face. I need to think about my spray solution. Definitely adjust the pH and probably, maybe, depending on what the material is, the, the surface tension, the viscosity as well. Okay, then I gotta be thinking about temperature, light, humidity, the tree sensitivity, and, and if I can factor those in, then I can start to better understand why I might have gotten a good response one time and a not so good response the next time, and I can adjust my thinking and my management going forward. So, take home messages, match the sprayer to the job, make sure you're using buffers, high volume sprays are a little more forgiving, you're gonna get better coverage, and you're gonna be less likely to overdose. Think about the cropping history of the tree, fruit set conditions, weather forecasts, all these things you, you need to be thinking about. And then keep careful records of all of these things so that you can adjust from year to year and, and fine tune your management strategies. Okay? And with that, I will 